This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Loctite's Pro Foam. Say no to inefficient and drafty. Say yes to Loctite's new Pro Foams. Loctite's Pro Foam line features three new products. The gaps and cracks and window and door items seal and insulate gaps and fit any standard foam gun applicator. Loctite's Fireblock Pro Foam fills gaps while resisting the migration of fire and smoke. Perfect for electrical, plumbing, and wherever a fire-resistant foam is needed. Say yes to Loctite's new Pro Foams. Say yes to Loctite. Visit loctiteproducts.com for more information. Hey, podcast listeners, be sure to check out Fine Home Building's e-learning opportunities. We've created a special discount coupon just for you. Learn about sustainable home building, using mini split heat pumps, insulation, finished carpentry, and more. See all of what's available at courses.finehomebuilding.com and then use the special code PODCAST20 for a discount on any class. That's PODCAST20 in all caps. Thanks for listening. And the floor, you know, the heat wants to rise. And like, is that, is that? Heat doesn't warm rise. Warm air wants to rise. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta dispel that notion. They're gonna rip the little blower door right off my uh, ball cap, right? <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor Mike Gurton. Hi, Patrick. Fine Home Building Senior Editor Brian Pontalillo. Hey, Patrick. And Senior Producer Jeff Rose. Howdy. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Great to see you guys. Thanks for being here this morning. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking ahead of the show. We are supposed to get a uh, days of rain. So uh, I'm watching my lawn grow uh, out the window <laughs> with some anxiety. And uh, yeah. How are you guys doing? Good. Well, I spread I spread grass seed last weekend. I did a whole bunch of grading and spread grass seed. So um, I, I did it right before one of the hottest weeks of the summer. But knowing that there's some cool days and rain coming is reassuring. You haven't had any rain, Brian, to speak of, right? No. And that's a problem for growing grass. Yeah. That is a problem for growing grass. Shade and shade and hot, dry days are not great for growing grass. Well, you should have germination uh, by the uh, end of uh, our uh, rainy season, which is a, nearly upon us. Well, hopefully, I was hoping you, you don't... by the end of the podcast. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say by the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, you don't get thunderstorms because that's like the worst thing when you just seed it along. Because yeah. then you end up with all that rutting in the surface, and then you get the little splotches of, of heavy seed and then the where it's been washed out, no seed. Yeah, it's really not an easy thing to do well, is it? Or to do, it's just not an easy thing to do to, to start grass from seed. It was, it was interesting. I had worked landscaping out on the East Coast uh, for a while when I was younger. And we always, you know, when, when we did lawns, we seeded them. And then when I went out to uh, work in the Midwest, um, outside of Des Moines, Iowa, uh, the, it was, the lawns were all installed by sod companies. So we would we would go in and we do the we would do the installation and there were, this was a, around a lot of new construction because the areas around Des Moines were really growing at the time there were tons of new developments and we were doing all these quite elaborate landscape installations and we so we would go in and we would do our work we'd do walls and patios and paths and then the planting crew would come in and do the planting and then the sod crews would come in right behind us and the the, the lawn would be in at the end of the day. Yep, really it amazing. Is- yeah. yeah. The last we spoke, Brian, you were uh, awaiting delivery of a skid steer loader and a, a plan to move a bunch of topsoil around. I guess that went okay. It, it went okay. Um, I have a tip about skid steer loaders, um, that I, <laughs> that I, and, I, and I've operated them quite a bit in the past. The, the work that I was just describing, I, I operated skid steers sort of daily for the year that I was working in Iowa. Those are the, the machines that we had. And you gave that job up? I know. <laughs> well, um, for this for this work, I got a very small. I got the smallest skid steer that the rental place had, thinking that that was you know just what I needed. And you, 
bounce all over the place in those, <laughs> in those small skid steers. It's almost unmanageable how bouncy they are if the train is not perfectly flat. So I recommend getting the biggest skid steer you can, <laughs> even, even if you don't need it, if you're going to be operating it for more than a couple of hours. <laughs> Mike, you told me last uh, email when, uh, correspondence that you were clearing uh, paths for a survey. Can you talk about that a little? So uh, in planning my new house, my, my wife, um, being from her architect background, actually sees things better when she has it on a piece of paper than if I actually plunk her on the piece of property to, to understand the, the lo- where we're going to position the house and then how we we're going to have to site grade it eventually. So she wants a full site plan, which means me going to the property lines and getting everything like dialed in. So I set uh, my, I didn't set, my father set the boundaries, the corner points on this property, uh, which is, it was adjacent to his uh, back when I was uh, five or six years old. And I remember where they all were from way back then. But of course, 50 plus years of uh, almost 60 years of brush growing around all of that stuff. Uh, I've had to clear all the tree limbs and brush so I can get my transit set up to um, get straight lines to establish a grid on the property so I can use my uh, laser to figure out what all the grade heights are to do the site plan. So, yep, chopping out brush along property So you're line. using an optical transit to shoot the corners or, uh, of, your, of your building lot? Yeah, old school optical transit, not the GPS enabled stuff that uh, surveyors have today. I, I wouldn't, I'd be lost with that equipment, but with a, an old transit and a stick, um, can do pretty good. And, I'm so and tempted to buy action. those at yard sales and uh, f- tag sales, but I honestly <laughs> don't know what I do with it. But uh, it's a very useful thing, right? Yeah, because you if, once you set a. a a, a, a regular telescopic transit up it's got once you set it and you set the position right over your corner point you can turn angles and if you've got a straight sight of line to another property point you can uh, see what the angle is or if you on paper know what the angle is supposed to be you can turn that angle on your scale and then shoot the line and then have somebody out at the other position you do need two people to do this of course and then that person can move left right with a plumb bob and then you can get your uh, line for your uh adjacent um property line so math is so cool (laughs) (laughs) i I wish i had my dad here with his slide rule he used to (laughs) put the slide rule out and be doing all of the calculations uh for for the the property and you know using the trigonometry calculus i don't know what he was doing but it was like magic it's trig, right yeah i think so he he was um when he was in college back in the mid 50s early 50s he worked summers for a surveyor uh so he knew all that learned all that stuff back in the field from an old timer uh, I think it's going to be a lost art because the crews I see next to the highway and on big projects are all using uh, lasers and I, I, they're, they do elevations too, right? Yeah. It's, they do everything. everything. Yeah. Everything. And another thing I've just been doing the last couple of days is uh, preparing for the Touch a Trade event, which is going to be on October 21st. Um, I know you know a lot more about it than me. I'm just <laughs> on the presenter side, uh, organizing what I was going to do and, and uh, you know, just thinking about it and corresponding with Mason Lord. Uh, I'm going to be doing uh, shingle design, having kids uh, use jigsaws to cut out designs in cedar sidewall shingles and then uh, stapling them onto a panel to kind of grow. I'm thinking have kids grow a vine up a wall. And each if kid- you're smart, you'll make this so you can integrate it into your new house when it's built, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll do it on a four by eight sheet of plywood and just glue the plywood <laughs> to the outside of the, the wall of the house. Yeah, it's a good idea. Thank you. What I know about this event is it, it is without 
uh, exaggeration, one of the highlights of my entire life uh, last year's. And I, I hope um, you all will check it out at touchatrade.org. Uh, it's going to be at the Connecticut Antique Machinery Museum and the Sloan Stanley Museum in Kent, Connecticut, uh, as Mike said, October 21st. And if you'd love to uh, see some kids have an amazing time using jigsaws and all kinds of stuff, uh, I would totally recommend you go and bring your friends, all of and them. They're, and they're looking for uh, presenters to do little uh, activities with kids as well as volunteers. So, And the thing that's different about this is the, oftentimes the activities are real. Uh, they're, you know, made safe, but it's construction is close as you can make it for, you know, a Saturday morning event. Jeff, uh, you feel like you're ready for the, uh, the deluge that's coming? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, like you, my, my lawn is overdue for mowing, but, uh, it's going to have to wait and I'll just hay it. Bill it up. And... <laughs> so I want to pitch, uh, an after show idea to you all that was Mike's idea to me uh, earlier in the week. And he had the suggestion of uh, worst of concept, the worst customer, the worst foul up, the worst job. And we're hoping that you listeners will write in with your uh, worst experiences. And, uh, right? We all have, have worst stories, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, or your Somebody worst contractor, was, you know, if you're a homeowner, what was your worst <laughs> contractor experience? You know, it, it goes all both ways. Well, I've been, um, to, to, for, as, as just a little bit of a preview of the worst of, and this isn't really exactly what you're talking about, but um, I have shared, I have shared w one of the um, things that went uh, wrong in my house, uh, which was that my front porch, front porch sunk. And I appreciate all of the, um, I appreciate all of the listeners who sent in ideas, and we did get a bunch of them. And uh, James wrote in with an idea that is is essentially what I what I ended up doing to that, and and it's what we talked about in the show, which was extending the extending the piers above grade and, and adding new uh, posts below the porch. Um, but I did I had another sort of um, situation that had, I had to remedy this week, and or or figured out the remedy for this week that had to do with our mini split heat pumps. Um, mm the house we had gone away on a, a week-long vacation this summer and so we were, we were running the air conditioning occasionally throughout the throughout the summer and we went away for a week and didn't and the air conditioning didn't run while we were gone and when i came back into the house after that week away you come in the front door and you kind of see down this hallway and you see the main uh, mini split head from the door and I, immediately i said oh no you know what the heck is that and there were there was this green staining on the wall below the below the mini split head, and so I walked over to it and I and I touched the wall and it was the wall was dry and I couldn't it, it looked it looked to some degree it looked drippy but it also looked like water had run down the wall but it also looked didn't look drippy it just looked like sort of this uniform green staining beneath beneath the mini split head, and so I did a little bit of investigation investigation what i could do with my limited knowledge of of the systems i you know i checked the filters to make sure that they were clean because i know you can get uh condensate back up when filters get excessively dirty and i went into the basement and i i, I did what i could to check out the condensate lines i uh, ran the equipment a little bit to see that the condensate was draining and everything everything looked fine so I, I was really, you know, I was really like, I, w I was stumped. So I finally called uh, the installer and he came over and um, he came over this week and, and took a look at the systems. And so he took, a, he took one of them off the wall and the, the one where the majority of the staining was. And the staining, we have three heads in, in the house and the staining was severe on the one we run the most. There was just a, a little bit on the one we run the second most. And then the one we barely run, I, I don't even know that I could notice any. Um, I, I, it was like, I keep looking at the walls to try to figure out if there's any staining below it. So what he discovered was that he stripped the insulation off of the incoming line set about six inches back to make it easier to make the connections that he needed to do. And because this is not where we, where the, where the indoor unit dehumidifies and is meant to create condensate to be collected, it doesn't sit neatly over the drip pan. 
So, so the, a condensation was forming on the refrigeration line, right? Yeah, it's sweating yeah. and it's sweating <sighs> down the wall because it's a copper line. That green staining is showing up slowly because this isn't this isn't like lots of water coming out. When I run the machine for a while, I can barely I can barely see it. I have to really use my hand to feel the wall for this uh, for this condensation. And so he has to come back. He's coming back uh, early next week with a bunch of insulation. He's going to take them all off and, and add the insulation back onto those lines. Wow. So yeah. the, the old school trick for that is you get a pair of vice grips. You you know push the insulation back and you hold it back with a pair of vice grips. And then you can slide it back into position when you're done brazing or f- flaring, whatever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And he said he's never had this. He said he's never had this issue before. And, I, you know, and he, he did. He was able to kind of for temporarily kind of push. I think he, he I think he attached some um, zip straps to just kind of hold it a little bit yeah. further back so that it's getting into the condensate collection. Oh uh, my God. I'm so glad there was a, a solution that like, suspense was killing me. It was just too much <laughs> to bear. Well, I was also uh, coincidentally last two weeks ago before he came, I was on site working with a crew in upstate New York, a, a building company that has, um, all trades in house. And so the, the, uh, mechanical installer who does all their heat pump installs and maintenance, uh, was actually working on this, uh, insulation retrofit at the time, because that's how this company works. And they didn't have mechanical work for him to be doing at the moment. And I was at, so I was picking his, his brain, asking him some questions. And he said, you know, hands down that what they get called back the most for on mini splits is just condensate problems. You and I were talking about this at a staff meeting, I think, and HVAC techs are dealing with condensate problems constantly. That is a regular source of pain for them. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Well, I'm glad you got that fixed. I would have been losing my mind seeing the green stain come up on the wall. Uh, Yes. I I (laughs) I was losing my mind. (laughs) How did you I clean the-, the green off the wall? Because that, that copper stain, it can really uh, defeat your paint. It, it's hard to clean off. I, I can't clean it off, Mike. I, or at least I haven't found any of the household cleaners that we have right now. That you need a good primer, off. and I don't know what the primer is for copper. That's not one that has come across my desk. <laughs> I have had I have had copper stains on paint before, and when I've painted over it, the copper bleeds right through, mm-hmm. at least with latex paint. Oh, interesting. So maybe so I might need an oil primer. Yeah. Or shellac primer, maybe. Or shellac. Yeah. Yeah. Or get the copper off. I think you got to tear that react. drywall out, Brian, copper. and redo it. <laughs> Cut it all. <laughs> what are you doing this weekend, Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> I got some exciting news, fans. Uh, folks who have been looking for wood fiber insulation in this country have had nowhere to turn, but we have been promised, I think it's for a decade, that there was to, supposed to be a plant starting up in uh, Madison, Maine. And, and the, the day has finally come. They're starting to ship loose fill uh, insulation, and it's called timber fill, and it can be used in uh, dense pack and blow-in ins, ins, uh, installations. And uh, I am thrilled about this because uh, this stuff has had to come from Europe and, uh, you know, any carbon uh, sequestration, uh, I'm guessing, is uh, evaporated on, a, on the cargo ship on the way over. So uh, I, I'm excited about this. I can't wait till they start making the other products. They promised to start making uh, bats and panels, too. So look for that stuff. I'll put a link on the podcast page for any of you who are interested in um, – Go Maine, Timber HP. I hope you guys have great uh, success. I, I really do. You know, it's amazing the um, amount of woodland in northern Maine that was traditionally up till probably the late 80s, early 90s used for the paper industry. All the paper mills have since closed, most all of them. So that left all of the north Maine woods sort of just growing with, I don't think, much of a market. So this provides a great market for all of the the wood products up there. I mean, they got loads of spruce and fir that just, they grow like crazy and gives all the employment to all the And this plant was a former uh, uh, papermaking plant, which is, yeah, which is really cool. So Yeah. Um, we heard from our friend, uh, Dave in Plainfield, Vermont, and, uh, Dave wrote in on the question of, uh, gas ranges, which we've talked about intermittently on the podcast for 
weeks now. Hey, podcast crew, I know I'm late to the party, but I have some thoughts on this discussion around gas stoves. With all due respect, I think Ian and Mike may have missed a valuable point in their dismissal of the New York Times article, biased though it may have been. I was a renter for most of my life and I was until I was finally able to buy a house. I think the gas stove in the indoor air quality case studies highlighted in the article might be more indicative of the rules rather than the exception. In those decades of renting, I lived in zero apartments or houses that had either any range hood or one that actually vented to the exterior or that actually worked if it did seem to have a wall cap outside somewhere. And without exception, every rental I have had has had a gas stove. Many apartments in larger cities have no clear pathway to vent a range hood. This can't easily be fixed, and landlords have very little incentive to care to try. And while all cooking is, as Ian correctly pointed out, creating chemicals and byproducts we may not want in our lungs, only gas is going to create nitrous oxides and benzene. Renters tend to be more economically disadvantaged than homeowners and are seldom in a position to demand better indoor air quality from their landlords, even if they knew they ought to. Most of us take it on faith that gas stoves are perfectly fine in all cases because that's what we've been led to believe. There are plenty of cases of other products that were known to be harmful, but were told we were told otherwise. To name a few, tobacco, asbestos, lead, DDT, the list goes on. Articles that point out some of the dangers might warn our attention rather than our quick dismissal due to their shortcomings. That said, I too wish the article had included some findings of units with properly sized range hoods as well as balanced ventilation. Heck, even a case study of the trendy Uber range hoods that suck thousands of CFM down its gullet. What is that beast doing to the indoor air quality of its domicile? That info would be quite valuable to me in my work. Maybe the author was worried about seeming like a shelf, a shill for big balanced ventilation. (laughs) 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 I know that podcast episode was from a little ways back at this point, but it's raining here again and we're citing a house currently. So I'm stuck at home listening to old episodes and I am sick and tired of estimating future projects. Keep up the great work. As always, what you do is so valuable and I hope you all feel appreciated for all your efforts. Uh, full disclosure, my house has a gas stove and no range hood. I keep thinking about it, but it's going to be quite difficult to retrofit one in. I bought an induction single burner that I use most of the time, but it's not an oven and I like to bake. I do have an HRV, which I'm hopeful helps. Cheers, Dave. Dave, thanks for the kind words, and thanks for your email as always. Yeah, Dave's right, right? Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, A lot of homes and apartments, especially older ones, don't have real good working range hoods. And what Ian and I were, I think we're kind of stuck on the new remodels and new construction where you can and should design in a good range hood where if you do it right, Gas isn't a problem, but for the rest of the world, yeah, gas ranges can be a problem. Well, and what Dave. you know, what he what he alluded to in the in the in his letter, and what you just alluded to, Mike, is that you know getting ventilation right is so tricky, and so it's you know balanced ventilation is I, I you know I, I I really feel like should be you know in, installed in in every house and and working well, but that's that's separate from exhaust, the need for exhaust in certain places like kitchen, bathroom and balanced ventilation, a kit, even kitchen exhaust with balanced ventilation without makeup air might be problematic. This is not easy stuff to get right. And I think that, you know, it's, it's mostly incumbent now on, you know, either the builders or, or HVAC experts to really know what they're really know what they're doing with, with ventilation strategies in a, in a project and looking at it holistically. You know, interestingly, we have another question in, uh, at the end of the show about, uh, you know, the consequences of tighter homes with regard to indoor air quality and humidity. So it's part of a, another conversation, right? Uh, what were you going to say, Mike? Completely lost my thought. So Sorry. No, <laughs> it's, just, it's my age, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep track of my own thoughts. Uh, Dave, I don't think you're alone with uh, uninvented gas stoves. Like every place uh, I ever rented had a similar situation, and my first house uh, had a gas stove with no range hood. So there you go. 
Uh, this comes from Tim. Greetings, podcast crew. I've been a listener since the early days, and even though I'm no longer able to work in construction, other than some remodeling projects on my own property, I still love thinking, reading, and listening about fine home building. I have subscribed over the years as finances permit, and the introduction of the podcast compelled me to subscribe again for a time. And now your after show tease has me thinking about how to budget an all access purchase again. Well, that reminds me, today we're going to be talking about tools that have changed construction, stuff that's come around in recent decades that have made our lives better. And if that doesn't get you to be an all-access member, I don't know what will. Um, Tim says, I'm currently in my third forever home in the northeastern part of North Carolina, about two hours from the Outer Banks. Although the lighthouses guarding the graveyard of the Atlantic still stand and receive much attention, there were once numerous manned lighthouses in the sounds along the coast. I have a bit of a chuckle whenever you discuss the great new advent of helical piles. I am a firm believer in post as an inexpensive and environmentally friendly way to build, an excellent way to utilize an all-weather wood foundation. My first forever home was a pole-framed house my first wife and I built over a period of three years. Did you notice first wife? <laughs> <laughs> The foundation consisted of three rows of utility bowls that ran from six feet in the ground to the level of the second story roof trusses. Bolted to the poles were two two by 12 southern yellow pine beams with two by eight yellow pine joists cantilevered about two feet past the poles so that any irregularities in the poles didn't get in the way of the plum and square walls. Many of the aforementioned lighthouses stood on foundation screws rotated into the muddy bottom of the sound or river inlet And when automatic lights are placed in, they were often built on the same piles. I've included a picture of a working drawing of a lighthouse originally built in South Carolina and also used to design at least one light in North Carolina. The detailed drawing is dated 1877. Uh, The article I found interesting is Screw Pile Lighthouses of Pimlico Sound. I'll link that on the podcast page for you all want to check out these beautiful buildings. I guess it is sometimes true what they say, whoever they are, that's what What's old is new again. Thanks for the informative and entertaining podcast. They continue to be one of the highlights of my week. Tim. Tim, that is nice. Uh, boy, these are cool looking buildings, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I went down a wormhole after looking at the, <laughs> after looking at the lighthouse uh, that, that that Tim sent, the the image of it. And I thought helical piers, I mean, I know they've been around for a while, but I didn't realize the first patent for these screw piles was in England in 1833. It was a wrought iron screw pile that that was manually screwed in with a capstan with a whole bunch of guys pushing on the the, the, the uh, like four by fours that they would stick into the capstan and they would screw these things down into the mud in the English Channel and other places around England for lighthouses that were out, you know, in the forefront of some uh, obstruction that you want to uh, avoid hitting with a ship. And then they adapted them here. Amazing, amazing. Amazing. What's old is new again. He's right. Well, and what's even cooler is Tim drew uh, himself one of these lighthouses, and it's an amazing pencil drawing, and I'll also put that on the podcast page because – It'll give you a chance to see how cool these buildings are. Oh boy, more on the subject of LED lighting. This one comes from Paul. I tell you what, the subject of LEDs have generated more correspondence to the podcast (laughs) email box since being over trucked and electric trucks. Uh, (laughs) Paul writes, hi podcast. In a recent podcast, the topic of LED strip lighting came up. While I agree that you, with you, that the technology should be taken seriously, Can I suggest that the toxicity of LED light to human eyes is a necessary part of the discussion? Some lights seem to be worse than others, and sitting under them for any period of time leaves me blinking and rubbing my eyes. How do we select LED lights that are more gentle? Is there a standardized metric for evaluating a light's likelihood to cause eye strain? How do we incentivize industry and educate consumers to make eye comfort a priority? Thank you for all you do. Have you guys ever heard of a metric for like the comfort of different kinds of light? I haven't either, except for color temperature, and I don't think that's what Paul is talking about, right? 
I don't, I don't think this is anything new. I mean, think about the fluorescence that we had flickering over our heads in offices for years before the LEDs came in. It, it, those, those were just as problematic, I, for me anyway. Problematic in, 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 in more than a sort of a preference or comfort way, Mike? Did it actually irritate your eyes? Oh, uh, yeah. After I, I didn't do it often, but whenever I would be under uh, the, the, you know, ballasted, the old ballasted um, fluorescence, uh, you get that just slight flickering. And I would, it would just give me headaches and my oh, eyes wow. drain and all that. And I just uh, would revert to the out of doors <laughs> for <Wow>. relief. <laughs> I was always claiming that that's why I wasn't an honor roll student to my parents, that it was the eye strain from, from the fluorescent being fixtures of the era. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, here we go. So uh, the, the questions this week are fantastic. Let's get right to it. So this comes from Jim. Hello, fine home building crew. Love the podcast, and I've been a subscriber to the magazine for over 20 years now. My customer slash neighbor wants me to reside a section of her garage. Upon initial inspection, I noticed it was leaning pretty badly out of plumb due to a huge sycamore tree that had grown into the northeast corner. She has since had the tree cut down except for a six foot tall by three foot wide stump, which the arborist said had too much metal in it to cut, uh, to cut the rest of the way down. They put some type of poison on it initially, and yet it has continued to grow leaves. It has recently been treated again, and I'm waiting for them to take that to take before I begin. When I checked the garage with a level, I found that the east and west facing walls were leaning one and one half inches and three inches respectively toward the south, while the north and south facing walls were leaning one and one half and three inches respectively to the west. I plan on using a YouTuber's method of ratchet straps and bracing to bring the garage back to relative plumb. In the video, they forgot to mention two important braces that go from the top plates to the bottom plates, but if you read the comments, you can see where they address them. It looks as if their garage is only leaning in one plane. Do you think this method will work for my situation or will I need some additional bracing? I'll attach a link with the video. Let me know what y'all think. I will also attach a crude drawing of the strap placement I plan on using. Thanks for your consideration, Jim. And I'll put the link to the YouTube video on the podcast page. What do you guys think? Is this going to work? Well, it looks like um, in the video, anyway, the building was studs with uh, the siding applied directly to the studs. So I am guess, that, guess that's what Jim is dealing with. So there's no diagonal bracing in the form of lead in diagonals, diagonal straps, or solid sheathing underneath the siding. So that means the walls can rack a little bit, especially walls with large openings like a garage door. So if that's what Jim's dealing with, it's just a matter of cranking that thing back that three inches in one direction, inch and a half in another. So whether you do it with ratchet straps or you do it with uh, turnbuckle braces, or you just make some sort of connection to the top of the building and you pull it to an adjacent tree, uh, anything that'll pull it back to position. And once you get it plumb, then you can, all the walls plumb, then you just diagonal brace it. And the diagonal braces done both in the roof assembly and in the walls are going to make the whole thing stable for the long term. Isn't it ironic that the tree that pushed this garage out of plumb is going to be the one that helps get it back into shape, right? <laughs> well, you know, Jim says that's what did it. And I question if the, the tree growing is what caused this whole thing to move, then the tree probably jacked up the foundation. And so there's, it might be a different problem going on than just the racking of the walls. So that's something to be sure that the foundation is stable underneath that uh, tree root or stump, because once that stump rots away in whatever, 5, 10, 50 years, uh, everything kind of, the foundation might move again. So uh, that would need to be evaluated. You know, I have no, I have no experience uh, with this kind of thing to, to, you know, to speak from with any, with any authority at all. Uh, but I, I did once help someone, um, uh, someone who I was working for, and just as sort of a project it wasn't even the kind of work we did but just as something he did to help out a client um we we kind of straightened up a small barn 
And we just put this sort of, you know, temporary horizontal post in and, you know, that we, we stuck in the ground and, and to, to just kind of yep. keep it from falling down for a little while. I believe that about 30 years later, that is still in place. And this, this barn is still like that. At least it was the last time I drove by. Uh, but what I, what I wanted to mention was just, I, I remember being surprised about how easy it was with ratchet straps to pull the building back up. Yeah. Yeah. Without sheathing, right? If it's got plywood on it, forget it. But if you have right. this kind of boxcar siding or, you know, uh, horizontal clapboards or whatever, yeah, it'll it'll pull it back. Yeah. What a fun project. I love like structural repairs like this. I think you, you ask if I want to come and redo your drywall. No, I'm going to go uh, help Jim fix this uh, <laughs> leany barn here. <laughs> It makes me think, too, what you were saying, Brian, you could almost use springboards on the outside of the building, right? Is that's kind of what you're talking about. Use it as a spring brace, but if you've got a, like an anchor point, like a, a post in the ground, and you put a board diagonally, and then you pull that down as it bends, and then release that bend that you put in it, it's going to push against the building. So mm -hmm. you can use a combination of methods to, to move a building back to plum the video the video shows a garage with very narrow walls around the opening and that's why garages are often structurally deficient because they don't have enough wall there to prevent this kind of racking failure and uh, i've seen uh buildings uh uh, uh lifted as mike suggests by roots of big trees and uh it's they don't go back down. You have to <laughs> get rid of the stump. Oh, man, this is another good one. Uh, Justin was very clear to mention his name at the beginning, says, so Patrick doesn't forget. <laughs> <laughs> Justin must be a regular listener. <laughs> How do you find air sealing partners? Uh, firstly, I would like to thank each and every one of you for making my morning commutes enjoyable and inspiring me towards my goal of someday having a warm house in the winter. For some reason, I recently purchased this absolutely disastrous property in northeastern Pennsylvania in one of the colder portions of Climate Zone 5A. I encourage all of you to poke fun at this air sealing nightmare. Pictures attached. I am the homeowner, not in the trades, and I'm renovating the house little by little on my free time. There's a two-story addition with the top floor of the addition as a master bedroom. The first floor of the addition is split into a bathroom, a hallway, and an open outdoor patio area. To clarify, the patio is outdoors and not part of the interior space. The covered patio is positioned underneath about one-third the length of the bedroom. Yes, the patio ceiling is a portion of the floor of the bedroom and takes up about six by nine and contains two can lights and one motion sensor light. The ceiling of the patio is some sort of thin, continuous corrugated plastic with no sheathing between the plastic and the bedroom floor framing. The stud bay simply contains about two inches of what was once fiberglass insulation, but is mostly mouse urine and mold now. <laughs> There was not even an ounce of effort put into air sealing, so the cold air in the winter goes up through the plastic and right into the house, up to the bedroom and down the hallway and bathroom below through the floor joist highway. Heating bills the first winter were over $600, with the house being kept extremely cold. The bedroom became so cold in the winter that I had to sleep on a bed in the living room. The bedroom was almost like sleeping in a tent outside. The bathroom underneath was also extremely cold, although not as bad. I'd like to prioritize preventing mold and dampness in the floor as there was previously an issue with mold on the underside of the carpet that was in the room and the fiberglass insulation. The addition is on the north side of the house and butts up against a hill with lots of trees and moss and gets damp. Here is my proposed plan and, and I would appreciate any tips uh, or input. One, remove the old plastic ceiling on the porch along with the two can lights and motion sensor light. Two, Install two inches of XPS rigid foam on the ceiling slash underside of the floor framing with cat nails. Three, screw in one half inch or so plywood under the foam. Nail and glue, tongue and groove under the plywood. Cut holes for electrical boxes. Replace the can lights with flush mount LEDs. Fill the holes with fire rated caulk and spray foam the outside of the boxes. Go to the bedroom floor joists and seal the gaps and corners with spray foam cans. Fill the cavities with mineral bats and then toss on a subfloor. 
Lastly, I was toying around with the idea of having a vapor barrier under the subfloor. As I mentioned, it's a humid environment and had concerns with mold. In cold climates, when you use baths with facing, the facing should face towards the interior of the floor slash wall assembly. But what, from what I gather, facing is not necessarily beneficial. Am I overthinking this one? Um, again, I cannot thank you all enough for what you do. P.S. I have two seven-year-old twin daughters that always scream, turn that off. We aren't listening to the fine home building podcast when it comes on in the car. I asked them if they would like to listen to the podcast if our house was talked about it. And they said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure some of your audience can relate to how annoyed our families get when all we do is talk about insulation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Carol just looks at me like with a blank stare sometimes. Boy, but I showed Carol these photographs and she, uh, her comment immediately was, she's like, some people think that fiberglass insulation is magic. <laughs> right? True. This house has no air barrier. This, that's why this, this bedroom is stupidly cold and it's cold air is traveling down the floor, Joyce, uh, as Justin points out, right? This, this needs to be dealt with, but the good news is there is so much room for improvement. Just in that one spot, right? Yeah. It's going to make a colossal difference in the comfort of this house. Yeah. So I, so he's got a list. Um, it's good. I would just change one thing in the order is instead of putting the XPS or the rigid foam on the floor joist first, I would actually put the uh, plywood on first because that's going to make it a little easier to air seal, I think, on the outside. Seal that to whatever you can get to on the perimeter with some tape and then tape all the joints and then put the foam on under. I mean, it's not a big deal to try to seal the foam up doing the same method, but I would just do it the other way. And then you can cut into the foam a little bit to set those pancake boxes. It would be nested inside the foam and then you can seal them up that, at that point or you wouldn't even need to seal them since your that foam is now insulation. And then put whatever you want for the finish over the foam. You just need longer nails to attach the whatever the, the, the final boards are the tongue and groove underneath just need longer nails to get into the plywood or into the joists it's against it, my better judgment to to contradict you here but I, i'm going to make a suggestion is is keep the assembly the way you have it justin but instead of using the tongue and groove uh finish ceiling gp makes a three-eighths thick uh grooved plywood panel that would do both jobs and save you a lot of work and probably a lot of money but if it's not going to look as good let's be honest and it's not that high up unlike a two-story soffit right where this stuff is commonly used uh but it is a pretty great product i think and um have you used this mike the gp yeah no I've used an LP product, which has grooves in it. It's part of their smart side program. I wonder if it's a similar thing that you're thinking of. So this the... is uh, pine plywood. Uh, it's about three eighths of an inch thick. So you, you know, uh, it's not going to span very well with the grooves parallel to the floor system. But if you put it the other way, it's, it's pretty good. So, so does it look like T111 or is it got a distinct groove? No, in... it looks like beaded fur. Uh, oh, okay. you know, a uh, two and a half inch beaded oh, fur, which is a, I, you know, very traditional looking porch ceiling. I have seen that. Yep. I've used it in t on interiors rather than exteriors. Now, my one reason, and I didn't mention this for putting the, the plywood in direct contact with the floor joist gets back to the mice that have been getting up in there, thinking that if they're getting in now, they're getting in some gap around that tongue and groove, perhaps, and if you put the foam first, the, they'll, they can chew right through the foam. Whereas if you put the plywood up there, they're a little less likely. Uh, I guess you could put the foam first, put the plywood, or put the GP product. But the key thing is going to be wherever the edge of that foam is around the edge, perimeter, you need to keep put something solid around that. You need to make sure that there's no way for the critters to scratch through it or cut through it or eat through it. Otherwise, they will get back into the uh, floor joist cavities. Now, he right. did... Go ahead. No, you might finish up. 
The, the, one thing uh, I noticed in the photographs is that it looks like Justin's pulling the um, subfloor from above. So I'm guessing he's going to remove the subfloor because he, he didn't. Yeah. In the sequence of where he's going to put the when he puts the insulation in uh, for the cavity insulation. Uh, but that could be done from underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, I would think it'd be easier than pulling all the subfloor up. But if there's a problem with the subfloor above in the photograph, he shows that maybe maybe it makes more sense for him with what's going on, which we can't tell from the one picture. To well, he's, he, he, he says it's moldy and it's not a surprise because it's freezing cold, uh, you know, for half the year, right? It's, it's a condensing surface. So, of course, the carpet is moldy and the flooring is moldy. So he might be wanting to get okay. rid of that, and I wouldn't blame yeah. him. Okay, yeah. um, makes sense. But once you solve the air barrier problem, Justin, you're not going to have a condensing surface, and it, it makes it seem very unlikely that you'll have a mold problem once you deal with this. Right. Yeah, I think uh, it's you know we're 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 giving refinements basically to something that he's you know what he suggested will work just fine, I think, and we're just we're sort of refining process, and, um, and so in that. In that way, um, he could also consider using EPS if he could find it, it or mineral wool um, board. Both are both of which are just a little bit more vapor open than XPS, so just a little bit more drying for this assembly uh, potentially. If if that's it, mostly floors. You know, if you're if you're air sealed and you have plenty of insulation, mostly floors don't. The risk of it getting wet in other ways is pretty minimal, right? Because it's underneath a roof and underneath the building, so you know they don't. Arguably, they don't need a whole lot of, of drying, but it's it's a thought. And then also just his question about the vapor uh, retarder. To your point, Patrick, it's not going to be necessary uh, once all this work is done um, on the on the warm side of this assembly. Totally agree. Is two inches too much? I, you know, th that's not bad. But I mean, uh, and the floor, you know, the heat wants to rise. And like, is that is that? He doesn't Warm rise. Warm air wants to rise. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Got to dispel that notion. They're going to rip the little blower door right off my uh, ball cap, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Is, is that too much? You don't, you don't think so? Uh, you don't necessarily need it. I mean, even, even one inch would be a, a good thermal break to the bottom of the joist. So, yeah, you could reduce the amount of insulation without a problem. Oh, Justin, I, I, I can't wait for you to fix this because your house is going to be so much better. Um, you know, I asked Justin if why not enclose that little area under the bedroom? Cause I think that would arguably make it a much easier, uh, uh, air and thermal boundary, uh, than, than insulating the port ceiling. But he likes the connection uh, or intermediate space between the indoors and outdoors. And if you look at his lot, it makes a lot of sense what he's saying. It's uh, yeah. kind of the in-between space between the walk to the garage and the walk to the backyard and the walk from the driveway. It's just a, it's just a nice outdoor space. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the soffit that is there, the panels that are closing the soffit, it's just vinyl soffit material. I mean, that stuff is, it's only a, you know, a 16th And it has a bunch of holes in it. <laughs> and it has a bunch of holes in it so that, you know, air and water drain through it, which is great for siding, <laughs> but it's not so great as a closure panel at the bottom of floor joists. And you know what, what makes me, uh, getting to our, our worst things we've ever done in our careers, uh, I've done this <laughs> on houses <laughs> back in the in the 80s and in the early 90s. We've put up soffit panels like this, the open vinyl soffit panels on a cantilever floor joist for like a garrison colonial. And when I think back to that, I'm like, oh, my gosh, we just made all these air channels, you know, like highways for air to leak into the floor joist system. Your point, Mike, is that now you've connected the outdoors with all the floor system, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the outdoors yeah. is running through every floor cavity. Yeah. So despite all the insulation we packed in that floor right there at the cantilever, it was just a filter fabric. It, and I mean, it it's very common glass. that porches are built this way and connect with uh, roof cavities and uh, have significant thermal uh, compromised uh, insulation and air barriers because of that too. Yeah. I love that, um, Justin gets this. He's, he solved yep. his own problem. 
And uh, I, th I think, uh, Justin, if I had half as much planning in my uh, home remodeling projects as you do, uh, they would be more successful. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's the deal here. I asked him, I said, uh, Justin, what do you do for a living? And are you, uh, is your family working, uh, living in, in, while you're working on this house? And he says, I work in healthcare as a physician's assistant. I've become handy enough over the years to do all my remodeling myself, but I am not an expert by any means. The family and I will be living, on the, living in this house during the bedroom remodel, but I'm moving everything out of the house and sealing up the space to the best of my ability. Um, good luck with that. And uh, just make sure you keep your kids safe from lead paint, right? But they're not podcast fans. I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. You know, they have to grow into it. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's an acquired taste, I would oh, it say. It sure is. <laughs> this comes from Scott, uh, and this is uh, related to our uh, conversation about indoor air quality uh, earlier. Hey, podcast crew, I found that I need a dehumidifier for specific times of the year, and I chose a whole home de dehumidifier because it ha it's hands off and I don't have to deal with except occasional maintenance. I don't know if my home counts as high performance. I was the GC on the build in 2015 and found GBA as I was doing research. I made as many changes as possible during construction as I learned more about air sealing and insulation, adding R10 exterior insulation, 475 supply tapes, and hundreds of tubes of caulk. The result is a HERS rating of 44 and 2.4 air changes at 50 pascals. I live in climate zone six and find that my HVAC does not run for days at a time in the shoulder seasons. We need dehumidification due to our HRV bringing in humid air. Based on current best practices, I believe I should have an ERV, but back in 2015, it seemed like my best choice was an HRV. I'm an enthusiastic DIYer and love the podcast. Well, thank you, Scott. Um, what do you guys think about this? Boy, that was the most underwhelming response <laughs> ever. <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, I mean, the, the, the one thing is, I, I mean, I think certainly an ERV would be helpful, um, you know, because it would exchange some of the, although ERV can be helpful. If the humidity is lower inside the house, he's trying to maintain that, but he's exchanging, you know, he's, he's bringing in outside air. It can definitely be helpful. I'm not sure, but it's not a dehumidifier. So I'm not sure that it's going to solve the overall humidity problem. I don't, I don't necessarily know that it would, you know, relieve the need for dehumidification if the AC is not running. It can't, right? It can't do anything. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't have a refrigeration cycle to, to do that. It's not, yeah. This is a super common problem with high-performance homes. I've run into it on homes that I've built over the years, and it's always in particularly the fall season here where I am in southern New England because we've got cool days, except we have fairly high humidity. Mm -hmm. So you, unless you can dehumidify the house through a dehumidifier, essentially, uh, you're going to end up with elevated levels of humidity in the house. Even if we, even when I've turned up the ERVs, we're still finding that the humidity ends up being high. And then you can get up all sorts of problems with that. And my customers, I usually get the phone call. It's not that they don't call and say, my house is really humid. I get the call, the floors are buckling. <laughs> <What's going on? laughs> and I'm like, oh. And I give them a digital psychrometer for a couple of days. And I say, here, monitor each floor and give me some readings. And then, the, you know, we're seeing, you know, 65, 75% relative humidity. Uh, and I know that's what the problem is. So we throw a dehumidifier in for a couple of days and boom, drops it right down. Just a portable um, yeah, it's always a quandary on what to do when you build a house and how to manage this. So uh, I think what, what Scott's done here and put in a whole house to humidifier seems like, and from what reading more about these uh, problems with the high performance home and swing seasons, that that the, the whole house to humidification is something that going forward, I'm going to be thinking about, and I think it needs to be considered by a lot of builders. Uh, Absolutely something true. Something that so they haven't it. thought about. Back in the day, you'd have an air conditioning system that because the house was so uh, energy uh, inefficient, 
the, the air conditioner would run a lot more than they do now. And uh, you'd get some dehumidification even when it was running intermittently. Today, if it's not coming on, you're not getting that benefit. So that's, I think, what's changed. And some the of houses the houses are a lot low, lower load. Exactly. And some of the, the, the uh, mini splits now, you can put it on a dehumidification setting um, and they work pretty well. Brian, have you tried that with your house at all? The dehumidification? Yeah. Um, it, it, the, the only drawback to the, yeah, on ours, it's called, a, it's called the dry setting. And the only drawback to that is what it essentially does is cools your house way down. It makes it freezing, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, low, the lower level that we're comfortable with. But yeah. you know, what, I, what I have, you know, what I have noticed this summer is that I have to, I have to run uh, the mini splits to, to dehumidify the house. And so I try to find a, we don't, we don't love using air conditioning all the time. We only really want it on like the hottest days of, of the summer. Um, but I've used it more than I thought I would just to keep, keep the, keep the humidity down. And I just try to find a setting where it's, where it's like, you know, it's dehumidifying enough and in at a keeping the house at a temperature where we're comfortable. Mm-hmm. And for us, so that's the, warmer than most people. It's not, we're, like I said, because we're not looking for. So it's finding that balance, you know. Uh, the window unit that's been cooling the barn for, I don't know, three years now, uh, quit working uh, recently. And Carol and I have been experimenting with uh, night flushing. And if you're unfamiliar with that, when the temperature drops during, you know, the evening hours or into the night, um, you open the windows and you evacuate the uh, warmer air that's in the building and replace it with the cooler outdoor air. The problem in New England is that it's often very humid and uh, it doesn't make it much more comfortable. But in places like the Mountain West, uh, these this works really well, right, Mike? Oh, yeah. Yep. That's what I do when I'm at my house in Arizona is the nighttime air can get down into the 60s, maybe not in the summer but you know it'll be in like the 80s low 90s in late september or october when i'm there and that but at night it goes down into the mid 60s open up all the doors and windows cool air dry air comes through shut them down around eight o'clock in the morning and the house holds temperature all day so mm-hmm. kind of instead of uh you, yeah it, it you, you take care of that you're kind of uh cycling uh, a little off from what the actual temperature is outside Jeff, as I recall, your house is uh, nearly air conditioned, air conditioned nearly all summer. Do you have uh, trouble with uh, humidity in in the shoulder seasons? Uh, yeah, to to a degree. I mean, because we don't run the air conditioning a whole lot. I mean, like Brian's, like we tend to keep it pretty warm most of the time, mm. um, and we do. I mean, normally we do so do some night flushing and things like that. But you know, like. This past week, it's like, you know, you wake up at five o'clock in the morning and it's 75 degrees and 98% humidity. It's like, I'm not going <laughs> to buy you horrible. anything. <laughs> yeah. It's the kind of heat that like, it takes your breath away when you step yeah. outside after you've been in air conditioning. Have you guys given thoughts to the uh, uh, after show topic of uh, tools that have changed construction? No, I didn't even read it till you mentioned it. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. We can wing well, it. Mike, that's disappointing because I wrote down a few ideas, just tools that were coming to mind, and they were all newer things. And I thought, oh, it's going to be interesting to hear Mike's perspective, which is much more long, longer than mine. But so we're going to take a five minute break before we do it. So, Mike, you got you got some thinking. I got five minutes. <laughs> Look around the garage. <laughs> you know. When they came out with the stab drywall saw to cut out those boxes, boy, what a revelation that was. I still got one in my box. I haven't one tried of one my of uh, early to... assignments at JLC was uh, talking about the, and I don't remember the context, but it was talking about the early history of circular saws. And it was, uh, I th- want to say, invented at the t- turn of the 20th century, right? And I think the tool was originally built for cutting sugar cane and uh, was adapted to cutting lumber by probably some smart carpenter. And uh, uh, it's pretty fascinating history, but I don't think we're going that ba- far back. Am I right? We're, we're, we're talking about newer stuff that folks might not be aware of. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Back when they invented nail guns. <laughs> Nail guns are on my list, dude, because, uh, yeah, because it, yeah, because yeah. they're awesome. That's why. 
the the uh, subtitle of the show is it's going to be on the podcast page. Um, the crew each brings their own list of favorite or game changing construction tools from recent decades. So if you're not already uh, an all, F Fine Home Building All Access member, I hope that entices you all to sign up. And if you are an All Access member, stay tuned for the show and thank you very much for your support. It's been a pleasure talking with you guys today. Thanks. Pleasure too. Yeah, definitely. And thanks to all of you for writing in. Uh, as I often say, you're the best part of the Fine Home Building podcast, so keep your uh, emails coming. We really do appreciate it. And when you do write in, think about the... Um the after show for forthcoming shows where we want to hear your ideas of the, the worst customer you've ever had. If you're a contractor, the worst contractor you've ever had, if you're a homeowner, the worst blunder you've ever done, the worst jobs you've had, any, anything like that. We do want to hear your war stories. I got one. I bet Brian knows what I'm going to talk about. And, uh, I had a little PS, PTSD reaction talking about excavating for uh, foundation waterproofing uh, uh, yesterday. So, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mike, Brian, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building. Check out the Touch of Trade website, will you?